Well, we're finally getting around to putting up another Thunderbird video. It's been a while. Uh, the parts I need, or the items I need, are in Little Rock, finally. It took them, God, it took a long time to get here. But I wanted those before I started bending the tubing for the gas line, which we will hopefully get done today. And uh, we'll go through that step by step. It may not look like the original when I get done, but I think it'll be pretty good, somewhat close. <laughs> time will tell, right? And... Uh, we're also going to go ahead and, and put those bushings on the end of each side of the upper control arm. And I'll show you how that's going to be done with the help of our neighbor down the road. He has a vise which will hold that horizontal bar uh, between the, you know, on, that goes between the, uh, the upper control arm. And I can put the bushings on each end while I torque them down. One of these days I'm going to break down by a vise. But anyway, it's uh, hopefully uh, in, in another few days or so I'll have one. Anyway, that's what that's what's on the agenda for today. Maybe maybe we'll get the carburetor on too. I don't know. One of these days we're going to get that carburetor back on the car. Trust me. Well, let's get started. Okay, let's start with the old upper control arm. Now, what we're going to be doing is taking these bushings right here. We're going to place this horizontal rod here that uh, fastens to the side of the car to the cross member. These bolts that go through these holes actually go through the fender on the inside, but they also fasten to the cross member that comes from underneath the car. Big, heavy piece of steel. So just the fender is not supporting these, okay? We're going to put these bushings on, one on this end and one on that end. Now, the way they, they describe it in the manual on page 316, uh, in the shop manual, uh, the object here is to not tighten these things up on this end and this end to where those ears squeeze in too far. And uh, to prevent that from happening, they want you to cut a rod three quarters of an inch in diameter. I have a five eighths, close enough. But they want you to cut a rod that's nine and a quarter inches long and then force it between here, you know, this right here, and this right here. They want to put a rod in there so when you torque down both of these bushings, it keeps it from squeezing in. So they want you to use a pipe, a one inch pipe or a three quarter inch pipe. And uh, I'm gonna use rebar. I got a nice stiff rebar there. We're gonna take my cutting tool and we're gonna cut off nine and a quarter inches. And we're gonna jam it down between here and here, parallel to this horizontal rod. Then we're gonna take the, the whole thing down. We're gonna put this rod in the vise and uh, start torquing these bushings on. But here's the problem. Here is the problem. It's been the same problem forever. They tell you in the book here to torque those bushings down to the uh, specifications. Well, guess what? The book doesn't show you what the torque value is. There are no specifications. The only place I've been able to find anything about torquing down these bushings is on a... Uh, I think I went to the uh, Thunderbird Forum one time and there was a fellow on there who has a 64 or 65... T-Bird, and he torqued his, he said torque him to 25 foot-pounds. Where did he get that information from? Nowhere is it, is it written down anywhere. He just said torque him to 25. Well, you know, so what's the deal here? I don't want these things coming off while I'm going down the road, you know, and this bar start to slip out this way or that way. That would not be cool at all. So I, I don't know what we're going to do. I'm going to check them at 25. I'm going to go ahead and put the bar in the vise and, you know, put that rod between there to keep the ears from collapsing. And we'll go ahead and torque one side and then we'll torque the other and uh, see what that looks like. Well, I'll be able to use my little auto writer pen finally again. I don't know if I use I used it for something once, but this comes, you get these at paint stores. These are so cool, all different colors. You just... You just press on and you know press down. It comes with a spare tip on it also. If you run, if your tip gets ruined, there's another one in there you can take out and use. And uh, you just press it down. It's got a shaker inside to shake it up real good. And then you know you can start marking and see see what it does. Put some nice, put some good marks on there. Whatever you're marking. I'll be using this one. We replace the floorboard on the passenger side of the car. That thing's about in there. I actually. There is no floorboard on the passenger side of the car, so on the front. So I'm going to have to, we'll just trim up the edges, what's left, and then we'll go ahead and get that floor in. But that comes way down the line. One of our uh, good subscribers, uh, what was his name? I think his name was Donnie Warwick. Donald Warwick. Sorry if I got your name wrong. If not, I'll correct it in the video. But uh, 
he said he's been watching the videos and it's been real helpful. And uh, so I told him that, well, I'm glad they, I'm glad that, you know, it's, it's helped. And we're going to be doing a whole lot more videos, which he asks me to do. I said, you know, there may come a time when there's just way too many videos, but after we get done, you know, getting the car to where it'll be safe to drive, we're going to be working on the interior. We got some little body work to do and everything. There's going to be lots and lots and lots of videos on this thing. It's going to be a nightmare for some of you. <laughs> but, you know, as long as people want to see them, I'll keep putting them up. When they say enough's enough, everybody says enough, then I'll just stop, you know, because this is for you. I don't do videos for me. I do them for you because, you know, it, it really slows down the whole operation. But I don't mind, okay, as long as folks want to see it. And it applies... Uh, all the Thunderbirds, it applies across the board from 64, 5, and 6. And a lot of the information being put out that I have gotten from other people. You know, a lot of this is it my doing. A lot of it comes from other people. And I appreciate what they've told me and shown me. And you go to other websites uh, on the Internet and it shows you things that, you know, I need to know. And then I can do and pass on to you. And that's the way it's done. You know, this is not all my stuff. Keep in mind. Uh, so let's go ahead and mark this thing at... Uh, nine and a quarter inches and get it cut i'm going to use my little uh my little air tool right here with the cutting wheel in it we're just going to cut that lob that baby right off and get ready to go see old bill at two o'clock this afternoon and use his vice one more thing people be sure to wear safety goggles or safety glasses now you know, regular eyeglasses are not good enough trust me did you know i'm not sure if you're aware of it but safety glasses are designed that are not the goggles but the glasses are designed that if it, something hits it the glass blows away if it hits hard enough to break the glass it, the glass blows away from your eye it blows outward away from your eye I'm not sure if you a good pair of safety glasses does that goggles are a different story depending on what they're made out of they're not designed to shatter but if glasses are being used they'll blow away from your eyeball and of course not all of it would probably blow away but they're designed to do that standard run-of-the-mill eyeglasses are not safety glasses keep that in mind if you uh you don't believe me someday you may have to pay the price all right let's go ahead and get this baby cut Well, I think that's going to be about right. What I'm going to do, here's your bar. You place your bar in there. And then we're going to go ahead and take these things and screw them on the end of the bar because the bars are threaded on the end, as you can see. I'm going to put a little grease on there. I want to put a little grease on there and a little bit of grease on the inside. I want them to go on there nice and easy. I don't want them to go on there hard and risk messing up the, uh, the inside here. I think the inside of that thing might be a little, little softer metal than than this here so let me get that done and then we'll take once I'm just going to screw them on by hand and kind of get it in place until we take it down and put this bar in the vise the vices and uh, then I'll take my ball peen hammer and then we'll go ahead and hammer this down in there you want it to wedge down in you don't want it to wedge down in so tight that you know it's gonna I was going to scratch up the paint yeah big deal but you don't want to bang it down in so tight that it actually forces the, the ear this way, the flange this way. You don't want that. You want it to go in there snug enough, tight enough, to where it just keeps them from squeezing in. Now, I may have to shave a little off each end, but I want you want it to hold itself, you know, while you're doing the torquing. You don't want to have to hold it in place. So you want it as snug as you can get. Now, you may have to wind up holding it anyway, but at least you're going to... Uh, uh, get it as close as you can okay you just do the best you can i mean you know we're just not master mechanics here just do the best we can following the instructions now the idea here is not to gob a bunch of grease on these threads you just want to put a light coat and i'm just using standard old uh coastal uniplex whatever grease you want you know just and you could use oil too or, but you know go ahead and put your grease on around the threads and just kind of take a rag and wipe out any excess you know the grease will get off the top of the threads but it'll be still down between the threads okay just kind of lightly wipe it off and uh, I just put a very light coat on the inside but here's where the dilemma comes in let me wipe down this other side while I'm still thinking about it here's where the dilemma just lightly wipe it nothing no not a lot of pressure okay the dilemma is 
I mentioned this in an earlier video, is that stupid grease fitting. Once this thing is on the end of the rod and it's tightened down to the, you know, whatever torque I need, how do you put grease in this thing? There's no place for the air to escape. That's a rubber seal around there. The air has to escape, unless it's designed to where the air will escape. I, you know, as this thing goes in, the, the, the shaft gets a little bit larger and it makes a tighter seal. So, I don't know, that's really strange. Now, some of these, when they first came out, had no hole in them at all for a grease fitting. And that's probably why. I mean, what was the point of putting a, a grease fitting in if you couldn't get the grease? The grease would go in so far and that's it. It would be stuck back here somewhere. I don't get it. I can't figure it out. I think what I'm going to do. What do we do? I don't know what to do. I might just take... Uh, I just don't know. <laughs> what I might do is screw this on fairly tight by hand. Take my little grease gun and shoot a few shots of grease down in there and hope for the best. I, Or I can take my finger, I suppose, and really put a few gobs down in there. But I, I just don't understand this at all. Why would they put a grease fitting in this thing? Anybody got an idea on that? Because it's just, it's just you know, you have to have air escape in order to put the grease in. <laughs> it's crazy stuff. I might figure it out by the end of the video. I don't know. One more thing. I remember reading or seeing in a video or something that these things are actually hard to get started. You have to have both hands, one on here and one on here. And you really got to force and push that, that rubber seal over the first thread in order to get that thing caught. They were right. Man, this is really tough to get on. But you got to work at it until it is. It's also a good idea to put a little bit of grease around that flat spot on the end of it and then down around the hole where it's fitting. Well, by the hole, I'm talking about this part right here. Just kind of grease that up a little bit. You know, you know, not much, just a little film. You don't have to go nuts with it, you know. You want to make this as easy as possible. I'll tell you what, we may not even get to the fuel line in this video. Man, I'll tell you what, I'm about half dead already trying to get this one on. This one on, this one didn't go on too bad. But this one here is just giving us all kinds of problems. To keep this bar from turning, I used a couple of punches in the holes. It's hard holding this and pushing this on enough to grab those threads. Once it grabs the threads, you're all right. But boy, that's tough. I don't know why they made it so tight. Okay, folks, we have reached a solid impasse. This thing is simply not going to screw on this end of the shaft. That, that rubber O-ring there is just, just will not allow it to go by. I, I've got to get it in uh, deep enough that it catches these threads right here on the inside. You can see them down in there. Anyway, you'll see the threads starting down in there. So it's got to come back. It's got to go in at least this far before it'll catch the threads. I can't even, I cannot get the end of this shaft past that old ring. So, uh, I'm tired of trying. I mean, I'm, I'm worn out. My hands are killing me. I tried a, a clamp. I tried everything. It just will not go past there. So what are, are the options? I've got to get it on there. I want this thing done today. Well, option number one is I can take some sandpaper and sand down the inside of that O-ring all the way around. It's not like it's some you know, highly critical uh, O-ring. It's just there to hold any grease in, I guess. Uh, or I could heat the outside of this thing, which would in turn, you know, not real hot, just warm it up pretty good to where it would soften up that gasket or that O-ring and enable it to slip over the top of this thing. That would be option number two. Option number three is just to go without it. Now, uh, when I took these off, the originals off, there was no O-rings in there. And I think I now know why. <laughs> they, they got rid of them all. They said, the heck with that. So I think what I'm going to do is uh, let's try the uh, sandpaper option first. Just take it down enough to where it'll finally slip over the edge and then catch the threads. Instead of uh, you know sanding this thing down by hand, what I decided to do is put one of my uh, dull sanding drums. I have one that was you know pretty much filed down. I didn't want to have something that would grind away the entire O-ring. I put a dull one in there, put it on very low speed, and just kept working it around and around. And took it down just a little ways. We're going to put a little grease on here. It kind of made it flatter. And uh, hopefully she'll slip over now and catch the threads. It finally went on. Just shaving that uh, O-ring down. I hated to do it, but what else could I do? It just would not go on. 
it's not this it's the o-ring was made a little too large huh, on this one here or the the seat that the o-ring sits in was not deep enough i'm not sure but it just flat wouldn't go no matter what i did but she went it was still hard to get on don't get me wrong but it, it eventually did go on now i've taken my rebar now according to the book it says you're supposed to put it you know force it between the flanges well you know that doesn't tell you exactly where are we talking you know you put this in a vise put this in a vise it says force it between the flanges but it doesn't tell you how deep <clears throat> it doesn't tell you whether this or this so what do you do well i think what you're going to have to do is make up your own mind on that i'm putting it here and here i hammered it down in with my ball peen hammer just kind of have to get it on down there like that it's a little bit deeper than that the idea we're not going to be torquing it that much anyway uh, but the idea is to keep the ears from coming in okay I wish the book was more clear, but it just doesn't say. It just says, force it between the flanges. Well, that doesn't tell me much. And, you know, what was the torque? It doesn't say anywhere, so what you have to go by, I, find, I think I finally figured out, what you have to go by is this one and seven eighths inches from the center of the hole to the inside of this little flange right here that sticks up. So when you get done torquing them, you should have that one and seven eighths inches, and it turns out to be 25 foot-pounds on each end. It's the only way you can do that. If you go any higher, you're going to wind up bending these tabs in. So let's see how well I've done. Now this is the flange they're talking about, this little thin part right here, not the thicker part. So from the inside of the flange to the center of the hole should be 1 and 7 eighths inches. Well, what do you think of that? Pretty darn close, huh? There's the other side. I think that's pretty darn close. However, I had to do one thing. I had to take these uh, rubber rings out. They were simply too big. I don't know what it is. They're too fat. They won't work. We tried everything, the two of us, trying to get that thing forced on. All it did was damage the thing, tear it up. They're just not the right size. That's all there is to it. All right. Uh, the only problem we have right now is this, uh, this uh, grease fitting faces the front like it's supposed to but the other one when I screwed it in see it's supposed to face you as you stare at the car with the bar bolted to the uh, <coughs> cross member this thing is supposed to be out where you can get a grease uh, you know thing in there to grease it with now maybe the air will get out and we'll actually be able to get some grease in it that would be kind of nice all right uh, the problem with the other side though is a little bit different because once I get it all the way screwed in it doesn't fit it doesn't uh, face straight out. It's, you know, I think it's like way down like this. So we're going to have to put a washer around there and then retighten it up. First, I'm going to try. I don't know. I, I think we better go with this metal one. It'll fit perfect around that threads of that thing. And then we'll go just like that. And then we'll go ahead and put it in there. And I think it might go ahead and uh, face the front when, when I get done, hopefully. All right, that did it. I had to use a flat nylon washer and a metal flat washer, but that got it facing the front like it's supposed to be. Sometimes you just got to make adjustments all the way. Anyway, so that's good to go now. Now, before I uh, put it back in the car, what I'll do is I'll clear coat. I'll, I'll put a piece of tape over the end of this uh, grease fitting here. Then I'll clear coat all of this, clean it off with some alcohol first, and clear coat it real good. And then uh, go ahead and give a, uh, a nice, uh, another shot of nice black paint on here. And on the bottom, wherever it got scuffed up as a result of us working on it, there's a spot down in there. We'll hit it here, there, and everywhere and make it look real good again. I don't want it to rust right away. It would take a long time for this thing to rust away. It weighs almost as much as I do. All right, let's see how little damage we can do in the process of this mess. Uh, one thing I did discover, <laughs> I hadn't noticed before, this is the throttle spring they used, which we saw. I thought it was just hooked to a piece of metal up here, but what it is, that is the bracket. They removed the bracket from the rear of the engine and bolted it up here to the front. Same, same bracket. It actually goes back here to the rear of this thing. It sticks up here. And then it's supposed to, the spring is supposed to go to the carburetor from there. They just, yeah, it worked, you know. And they just needed a spring and they got one. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut away this spring. This is just a piece of wire they hooked it to. <laughs> I just hate jury rigs. I can't stand jury rigs, you know. Listen, guys, if you, have, if you buy a different carburetor for your car, make sure you have everything you need to put it on properly before you make the purchase, okay? Don't, don't, don't buy the carburetor and then figure out how you're going to jury rig it to make it work. If you, don't, if you really don't know what you're doing, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, you can make it run, but you'll never really get the efficiency and what you were looking for from your carburetor when you made the switch. All right, let's go ahead and cut this way and you know, see if I can't remove that bracket. There's a better shot of that bracket right there. All right, let's see what we can do here. Uh, I found out one thing after removing that uh, bracket for that spring. It won't attach. There's no bolt down behind here that's supposed to go on. This thing is supposed to go on about like this. So we can hook a spring up to that hole at the top. And uh, it's just not working. But unless the bolt is way over here. i got to find out. I, I can't find any bolt back here. I don't know where the bolt would be. That's the strangest thing. Unless it bolts to the bracket that holds this mess on. I'll have to take a look at it. It may be a bolt down there that, that goes on there. I'll check it out. Not a big deal right now. Right now our primary problem is uh, vacuum lines. Now a while back one of our subscribers, you know, he jumped way ahead of me, which I, I, I don't, I prefer you guys not to jump ahead of me uh, in these series, you know, so it'd be like right now telling me, well, what you should do about the interior floorboard. You know, hey, we're not even close to getting there yet, so don't talk to me about stuff like that, you know. He, the, the, our comment uh, that was left by one of our good subscribers was a good comment, don't get me wrong, he was just way ahead of me. And so I didn't address the comment, but I, he was right. And, uh, but I decided I'd wait until it comes time to put the carburetor on to talk to it, you know, one step at a time. Keep this thing flowing in a somewhat orderly fashion, okay? This is our vacuum lines, and you can tell, he said, you need to reroute the vacuum lines now that the carburetor's off the car. He's right. I got more room, okay? And uh, this is what he was talking about. Of course, this, this thing here is tied up into our linkage. How dumb can you get? Here's another one tied up into our linkage. Look at, look at this thing. Look at this thing. You know, this is the kind of thing that you want to always avoid. You're downtown, or your wife's downtown driving the car, and you've run vacuum lines and every other thing, who knows what, through your carburetor linkage. She, she lets up on the gas, and the car won't stop because it's all jammed up with this stuff. Crash into the guy ahead of you. All right, that's what it's all about. Do it right. This thing is supposed to come off. This uh, uh, vacuum booster here is supposed to go... Uh, we're gonna buy a new hose. I need it. This stuff's here too short. They cut it. That's what it was. They didn't want to. They didn't want to spend the money, you know, to buy a new hose like it's gold or something. Anyway, it's supposed to run across the top, underneath the lip here somewhere, and a clamp of some sort put down through here, maybe a tie of some kind, and then come over and come around and hook into the vacuum booster here. Okay, but that's not what they did. They just ran it through the linkage. Don't do stuff like that. <laughs> and here's some more vacuum line running through the linkage. I mean, is this the dumbest thing? Don't. No, this has got to come out, too. I can't even imagine doing that. Look at that. I mean, come on. Jeez. Anyway, let me go ahead and tear some of this crap apart. You know how I hate tearing stuff apart? Yeah, right. <laughs> We're going to tear it apart. We're going to do this stuff as close to righteous as I can get it. Well, here's one for you guys. This one caught me completely by surprise. I had no idea. I thought this was a vacuum line. Well, when I disconnected it from the rubber hose, that, uh, that rubber hose right there, when I disconnected that metal line, what came out of it but hydraulic fluid. Well, that's no big deal usually, but this line goes up and connects into the firewall right there. Well, where does the other end go? The other end, this thing right here, goes down into the power steering box. Not the front of the box, but closer to the firewall. It just goes down, and there's a fitting on the end. It screws right into the power steering box. So I'm thinking, what the heck? Why would power steering fluid be coming up this line here, going through this metal line, be going into the firewall? It doesn't make any sense. There's nothing in there you could use... You know, power steering fluid or hydraulic fluid. Well, guess what? I sat down with the book and I said, I've got to figure this one out. I've never seen this before. What do you think that is? I'll give you a couple seconds to mull it around in your mind. 
Now let's go to page 1031 in the uh, manual and it will show you your fuel line. Here's the gas tank back here. Let me get my pencil here. Okay, it's hooked from the gas tank through a flexible line, through a metal line, all the way up and to right here on the front of the car. Let me back up just a tad here. Right here there is a connection and uh, to the main fuel line that comes from the rear of the car and on our car it's messed up it's too short and it's rusty I'm gonna have to remove it but what you do it comes up and it takes a slight bend and then there's a rubber hose a rubber gas line goes right here a short piece of hose okay then the hose is bent the tube rather the fuel line is what we're talking about the metal fuel line there's a, there is a short piece of hose here it goes up underneath the fender and it goes across I'll have to bend it best I can and then up and over and down and then of course there's another rubber hose right here that goes over to the fuel pump itself okay so it's gonna to have to be bent now I can buy this thing already bent and you know if I screw it up bad enough I may have to ultimately wind up buying it but I'm having trouble finding just this piece right here they want you to buy it from here all the way up and it runs about a hundred bucks seems to be an awful lot of money for lousy fuel line hundred dollars uh, plus shipping so what are we talking a hundred bucks for a, you know ten bucks worth of tubing I don't understand that so I'm gonna to try to bend it myself I'm gonna I'm gonna put a new piece right here underneath the car you'll see the rusty one we're gonna to have to remove right here bend it up at an angle and then throw in a little rubber hose which I have and then start doing this business to see how that works Uh, I told you I was going to go ahead and bend the uh, gas line and get it ready to where it would come up and go over and connect into the uh, fuel pump. But I have a problem. I need some help. There's several of you who keep up with this video, this video series that own 66 Thunderbirds. And maybe even 65, maybe 64, and they're probably all essentially the same. But primarily I'm looking for those who have the 66. <coughs> The gas line comes from the rear of the car, and it comes up here. Now, keep in mind, there's a splash shield that's missing here. The splash shield will go in. Where does the gas... The, the, the book shows the, the drawing. I showed that to you early in, in the video. But it doesn't say whether the gas line runs on the outside, which would be in the tire side, the wheel side of that splash shield, or does it run up behind it and then come out somewhere up here in the top? And it could, you know, there is a, uh, there's a thing where it comes up, over, and down. <coughs> I got some of that crap in my throat here. It comes up, over, and down. This is the hole that holds the, the crossover part. There's a clamp that goes right there. So it'll come up, over, down, and then it comes down and runs along the, the frame or the, uh, the body of the car out to the fuel pump. The question is, before it gets to this point right here, does it come up on the back of the splash shield? Or does it come up on the front of the splash shield? And the same thing applies to the brake line, which I have right now covered with a, a socket that I that I didn't want to get any uh, I didn't want to get any uh, paint and you know undercoating and stuff there, so I covered it up with the socket. Okay, now if if someone would take some time, I, now one 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 of our good subscribers did this already, but the pictures were so dark I can't make them out. If you can like shine a light up in there, turn your wheel to the right. And uh, shine a light up in there with a, and, and take a couple of pictures so I can see where it, uh, the brake line, does the brake line go up? I, it seems to me the brake line would go up behind. And I think that's the way, see the problem, the problem I'm having is it was, it was jury rigged again. And, and I know what, the, the way they did it was not correct. So I don't know the correct way and I can't tell it from the manual. That's the problem. So this will be something that you can help out other Thunderbird uh, owners who have had someone jury rigged the same setup. Uh, you know, some, some I imagine, have run a flexible gas line, the black stuff with clamps. Well, I don't really want to do that. I want to do the part that's supposed to be metal, and I want to do the part that's supposed to be the black rubber gas line. So, you know, and uh, so if you can kind of take a picture or a video or something, load it up to YouTube or something, and uh, I'll include it in one of my videos later on because I, I can't, I just can't, I don't want to be bending these lines right now because I don't know how to bend them. I don't know where they go. And uh, that would really help a lot. So Now, you can upload it to YouTube and post a link on this video for all to see, which would be good. Uh, you know, where the line comes in, where it goes up, where it goes out, and lots of light so we can tell what's going on to include the brake line 
and uh, or you can go ahead and just send me a link to my uh, email address, which of course is my YouTube handle at gmail. Okay, dot com. So we can do it that way also. I'd appreciate any help. Now I know some of y'all have those cars, so take some time. Go out. It will hold the whole thing. It won't take you more than what I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. You know, it would help a lot. Okay, now let's go up and take a look at our little hydraulic fluid here. Hmm. Now I know that some of you are saying, well, I know exactly what that is because you've dealt with this before. I never have. I've never seen this on a car. Of course, I've never owned a 66 Thunderbird either. <laughs> even, the, uh, even the Oldsmobiles I used to own in the Plymouths never had any of this. Well, I'm going to tell you what it is. The windshield wiper motor is behind the firewall up underneath the uh, dash. The windshield wiper motor is not electric on this car, and it is not vacuumly operated. The windshield wiper motor, this car, <laughs> is operated by hydraulic fluid. It's a, a hydraulic motor that runs both wiper blades. Is that weird or is that weird? Anyway, they get the supply of, hy of a hydraulic fluid that they need down this hose. They, someone's cut it, see? This is, there again, this is really stupid, stupid. Anyway, they cut the hose, and the hose runs down to the steering box that has the hydraulic fluid that supplies the system. It's always being pumped in there, but it's only, I mean, it's always being supplied there, but it stops until you turn on the wipers and then the fluid goes through and operates the motor. Shut the wipers down, the fluid stops flowing. And it's supplied by the fluid in the steering box down in there. See that steering box way down there with that round thing? Isn't that amazing? That's that right down there is where the hose goes in. You can see it. Amazing, amazing. I never would have thought that. You know, I know old Brendan's out there thinking, saying, well, this is old news to me. You know, Yeah, it is old news to him, but not, it's new to me. I thought it was pretty cool. But at the same time, I thought it was pretty stupid. I'd rather have an electric set of motors in there, an electric motor in there, than something that's hydraulically operated. What were they thinking, you know? Anyway, well, I think what we're going to have to do is cut this uh, video off here. I'm sorry I didn't get the, the, the uh, gas lines bent the way they're supposed to be, and uh, I've got a lot of jury rigging to do down here, un-jury rigging, to try to get that so I can put the carburetor on. And uh, bummer, bummer. So I'm gonna clean all this crap up. Next time, uh, we'll start right here, right here. The next video we have, we will start right here, and I hope to have had lots of, you see what I gotta do? I gotta get this out of here. This has gotta come out of here. There's something new has to be put up here. It's a, I assume that's a screw-on fitting right there. I might be able to get it off there, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to put in this place. I'm going to check with Thunderbird headquarters to see if they have anything like that. <coughs> I'm also going to try to get this uh, clamp, I mean this uh, bracket, put on in the back back here some way. Where's my JB Weld? <laughs> anyway, we'll get it mounted some way. And then we'll go ahead and run a brand new hose across and down on this with some kind of a clamp set up up here. It's going to be fun. That's what we're going to start out with. And we're going to keep working on it next time until it's until the carburetor is completely hooked up the way I actually wanted to do it now. But anyway, at least you saw how to do, uh, or at least part of how to do the uh, control uh, the uh, bushings on the upper control arm, okay? Anyway, until next time, this is John. <laughs>